I, I was saying uh, last night, John, that Lillian, I'm the only Scottish person that she knows. So it could be there's people here who've never met a Canadian. Who's never met a Canadian before? Lillian again, very sheltered yeah. <laughs> And some of these people might not even know where Canada is. <laughs> John has been uh, lecturing for the last 17 years at Regent College in Vancouver and that was where I first met him when I was visiting James and Jane when they were studying there and also Ruth and Hosway who were there at the, at the same time and James actually worked for a while as John's teaching assistant at uh, Regent. No, I really didn't. Say so, yeah? No, I really didn't. Do you want to do something for him? <laughs> James claimed at the time that he was working as John's teaching assistant at, uh, at Regent, um, which turned out to be a complete falsehood. So, uh, what James was doing and where he was getting that money from, were we uh, conducting an in-depth audit on while we're, while we're here. So uh, Ian, if you could bring the gun and mark the rubber truncheon, that would be, uh, that would be ideal. Now that gentleman at the back who's, uh, who's escaping is Frank Scrimger, and you're coming back later on, Frank? I'll be back in a minute, I'm sorry. <laughs> Texting like a teenager, that's fine. <laughs> Frank is a lecturer at Waikato uh, University, and he's one of the honorary vice presidents of uh, TSCA. John, what family do you have? I've uh, got one wife. And <laughs> three, three sons. Now, James claimed at the time in Vancouver that he was only had one wife. Is that also true, or is that my memory <laughs> playing tricks on me again? James actually met his wife at Regent College. Did you introduce them? I didn't. But, uh, it happens a lot at Regent. Oh. Good. And you're just moving um, across to New Brunswick to teach at a different uh, institution. Yeah. Tell us a bit about that move. Well, I'm, I'm moving to a, a small uh, Christian university on the other coast uh, of Canada. Um, so I've, I've, I've John, decided that... Just speaking of the Yeah. Well, I decided that uh, living in Vancouver had, uh, had made me soft and it was time to reclaim yeah. my Canadian manhood and so I'm moving back to the snow. <laughs> <laughs> Because most people in Canada migrate westwards as they get older. They, they do, they, they, they do, that's right, and, and that's what makes them feeble. <laughs> <laughs> so it's good that you're in New Zealand because that'll toughen you up for your, uh, for your move back. First time in New Zealand? It is, yeah. And you've been looking around a little bit with, yes. uh, with James, so he claimed anyway, but that might not be true either. Um, <laughs> where have you been? Well, the, the, the most moving thing was did was to visit Waitangi, and uh, that was really powerful. I'd, I'd read a lot of uh, New Zealand history before I'd come, but it was wonderful to see that uh, site. Um, and uh, we've seen some uh, very large trees, um, <laughs> a couple of them as big as we have in British Columbia, so that's been very impressive. And, uh, and the birds making extraordinary uh, sounds. Um, so that some of that was James, actually. <laughs> Understandable. So. You were um, lecturing mostly in the area of kind of business and faith integration and ethics and those kinds of those kinds of things, but you've got quite a lot of things that you're interested in in terms of your research and teaching interests. Just give us a little bit of background about what you're most sort of passionate and interested in. Well, I'm most interested in the in the intersection of Christianity and modern life. Uh, I was trained originally as a historian of European and North American history. And I became increasingly interested to know how does Christianity make its way in the modern world, particularly the last several centuries. And some comparative studies interest me. So currently, I'm, I've got to have a research program in multiculturalism, diversity, coping with different religions and different ethnicities. And I'm interested in actually in a comparative program of uh, Britain, uh, Canada, US, Australia, New Zealand, and the Anglosphere, as we call it. Um, to, to, because each country has uh, similar problems, but is negotiating them sometimes quite differently. Um, so it was, it was interesting to, to come to know uh, a little bit more about New Zealand and see how you're... you're uh, uh, every country is struggling with it too, I mean, and I think nobody's figured it out. Uh, multiculturalism was an easy slogan until about 10 or 15 years ago, but it's only gotten interesting in the last little while, uh, when there are significant 
uh, called critical masses of the other um, in our various communities. And uh, we can't simply assimilate people to a, a white uh, majority way of doing things. Um, so, so I think now is the time for Christians as well as others to step up and talk about what pluralism can mean and what uh, being a neighbor can mean in a realistic way rather than a sentimental way. Cool. So you're here to speak to us for the rest of this week, and then yeah. you're going across to Australia, and then coming back to do some stuff in the uh, Otago University down in Dunedin. What are you going to be talking to us about this uh, week? Well, how, how to be a Christian in the world. I figure since I uh, have only been to make maybe ever one visit to New Zealand, we might as well just talk about everything. <coughs> so that's what I'll do. <laughs> but it'll take me several mornings to do that. Cool. Great to have you. Let Thank me you. pray for you. Lord, we want to thank you for John and for his family. Thank you for watching over him and for the many things that you have taught him, for your grace extended to him. And I pray that you might speak uh, to him and through him while he is here, that it would be a significant uh, few days and that you might uh, bless him as he blesses us. Pray that you would give him wisdom. Pray that your spirit would speak uh, through him. Pray that you would illuminate your word to us and that your spirit might apply it to our lives, that we might be different through interacting with your word together in this place at this time. So bless John, we pray, and use him to your glory. Amen. Well, that was the best part of the presentation, so I glad you enjoyed it. Will it be all right if I don't use the microphone? Because it's, it's too long for me to listen to myself if I can't move around. Is this going to be all right? I'm going to look and get the folks in the back. And, and those of you who, after you find out for a little while, don't really want to listen to me, you know, you can migrate to the back and then <laughs> sleep comfortably back there. That's, that's, that's fantastic. So we have a few uh, mornings together, and I'm going to cover a lot of theological territory in a um, deceptively simple way. So... I don't want to, I want to put you on your guard right now that I'm going to say a number of things uh, that will be unfamiliar to some of you, but it'll sound kind of familiar because I'm going to use familiar language. I'm not going to use a lot of technical theological terminology, but you need to try to keep your wits about you because you will occasionally think, well, that's not what I was taught in church, or that's not what I read in the most recent book, or that's, pre now I'm not deliberately trying to contradict things that you've read or things that you've read in church. But my experience tells me that I probably will say some things that will be new and perhaps strange, and even some things that you might find initially uh, you're not terribly comfortable with. So I'd like you to do two things about that. Number one, notice those things, write them down, record them, uh, so that you get down what you think I've said. And then secondly, uh, don't, don't freak out about it. Oh, you know, heretic. No. <laughs> <laughs> be sad, but I'll keep on talking anyway, so you might as well listen. But then take it up with me in the question time we'll have after each of these sessions, or come see me privately, or take it up with one of your leaders. Um, process it, right? Don't, don't simply say, well, I, I, don't, I don't agree with that. He's clearly you know, ungodly, I'm done. That would be a shame. Uh, I, I mean, I am ungodly, but I say some things helpful, too. Um, I mean, I'm a sinner, but I'm, I'm not wrong about everything. So I, I will try to offer you some things, as I say, that will be unusual, uh, maybe difficult in some cases. So let's try to work together. And it may just be that I said it wrong. I mean, I may, may, I may be wrong, in which case you need to help me out and not let me get back to Canada without uh, being straightened out. So I'm not right about everything. Secondly, I may have meant to say the right thing, but you know, speakers occasionally get mixed up and we, we say things backwards. Well, help me out with that. Say, did you, did you really mean to say that there are 23 members of the Trinity? <laughs> Stumbled there. Thanks for helping me out. Because I don't want you going onto Twitter or onto your blog saying, John Stackhouse just said there were 23 members of the Trinity, right? That would make uh, uh, for, fu for future employment for me difficult. <laughs> let's, let's check that out with each other before we leave the campgrounds, before we go on the net, and, uh, and, and make sure that we understand uh, what I'm saying, what you're saying, and we'll do we better that way. So I'm going to go, as it were, somewhat slowly, but that's because for many of you this will be new, and for some it will be challenging. And for those of you who find it uh, familiar, uh, you can just um, go into your prayer mode and uh, carry on. As you need to, but I expect it'll be useful for all of us at some point. So I want to ask this basic question. 
really, as Christians, what in God's name are you doing? What, what is it that we're doing in the world? And really, in a sense, this is basic ethics. And it's really basic ethics. We tend to think of ethics in terms of right and wrong, right? good and bad, what, what's good to do, what's bad to do. But in fact, ethics comes from the Greek word ethos, which has to do with character, with the fundamental nature of the thing. My father was a, a surgeon, and when I was a kid, I couldn't understand why um, other boys and girls' parents got to advertise their family business uh, in local newspapers or in yellow pages. This is back in the Middle Ages when we had those technologies. <laughs> uh, nowadays, it would be one's own website and so on. <coughs> so how, how, Dad, how come you want to get this one little line in the phone book, you know, J.G. Stack as MD? How come you don't advertise like everybody else? And he said it would be unethical for me to do that as a surgeon. And I didn't understand that as a kid. So I thought, well, what's morally wrong about advertising? Why are surgeons not supposed to advertise, but hairdressers or garage mechanics can? I mean, it didn't make sense to me in terms of morality, right? But it wasn't about morality. It was about appropriateness. It wasn't seemly. Uh, a, a physician doesn't advertise. A physician, in their view, has, is a sort of professional who's simply there to help people, and people, as it were, come streaming into the physician now. Find that a little bit amusing, uh, given the history of medicine. But anyway, that's that's uh, what they thought. It wasn't in the, uh, appropriate to the character. Of it. So what I want to get at with you over these several mornings is really basic ethics. What does it mean to be a Christian in the world? Right, we're going to not just look at what's right or wrong. I'll just move this out of the way since I'm not using it anyway. What does it mean to be a Christian in the world? And that's going to be uh, the focus of our conversation. In North America and in other countries, and I think it may well be true in New Zealand as well, when we talk about this subject as Christians together, and I, know, I don't assume that all of you are Christians, but I assume most of you are, and most of you are interested in the Christian faith, and that's why you're, why you're here. There tend to be two traditions, two goals and two modes that are offered to us as what it means to be really Christian not some sad, temporizing, compromising, wishy-washy Christian, but a serious Christian. You're going to be seriously Christian in the world. One or the other of these traditions and modes and goals tends to show up. Here's the first one. Be holy and, and stay holy. This is what it means to be a Christian. This is the way I was raised in a small Protestant group in northern Ontario and Canada. And the way we thought about being a faithful Christian was to be holy and stay holy. So we were really big on identifying sins and then not sinning and helping each other not sin. And we might also make the occasional evangelistic foray out into the world. We would leave the, the safe precincts of our church and occasionally go and try to snap them from the fire, so to speak. And, and bring them into our holy place. But, but generally, our outlook was the main task of a Christian in the world is to be a kind of light, uh, a kind of alternative, a kind of witness. And so it was crucial that we stay holy. And this is the kind of attitude toward culture that we typically see in a number of smaller Protestant groups or sects. It tends to be the operating principle in Pentecostal and Charismatic churches, that with them, our main concern is to focus on Jesus and to remain unspotted by the world and to be a kind of light shining to the others as we huddle up together, even if our huddle is very, very big, as some churches are. It tends to be the attitude of the Anabaptist movement, that our concern is to fundamentally imitate Christ and to show Christ to the world through holy living and appropriate Christian service. At the most sophisticated levels, you'll see it in the work of John Howard Yoder and Stanley Harawas, that the fundamental attitude toward the world, I'm using simple terms now, but the fundamental attitude toward the world is to be culturally different. The church is supposed to be a different culture. It's supposed to be an alternative community. We're supposed to show the world a better way, okay? And this, of course, is exciting. It's challenging. In many ways, it's faithful to scripture. In fact, why wouldn't I espouse this approach? 
I was raised in it, in Minspire. Uh, I've uh, engaged actually Yoder and Harwas <coughs> I've read a lot of their stuff. I appreciate it in a lot of ways. Well, why not? Often, not always, but often this approach entails a lack of cultural engagement. That is, that we, if you're in this approach to the world, we tend to avoid much of the world. We're afraid of it, sometimes properly. We're, we're afraid of what might happen to us. We, we don't understand it. It repels us in some ways, which again, quite understandably. And so we simply don't interact with it, and therefore there's no salt in life in those spheres. There's no Christian influence, because we're not even trying to influence it. We're actually trying to not be connected with it. And what I found in the, the form of it I grew up in is that Sunday after Sunday, sermon after sermon, Sunday school lesson after Sunday school lesson, book after book, seminar after seminar, we never talked about, we never even talked about what most people do most of the time. We never talked about business. Never. We never, except don't sin. We never talked about that. Like, don't, don't cheat on your taxes. Don't rip off your employees. Don't shortchange your vendors. That kind of stuff. We might, we might say that, but, but aside from don't sin, and try to mention Jesus as often as you can at work. In fact, we even taught each other clever little games and bruises to, to, to bring Jesus into conversation. Even, even conversations Jesus didn't particularly want to join. We, we, we tried it in any way. Did you see the game last night? Yeah, I did. See that goal? That was a great goal. It sure was. Does your life have a goal? <laughs> and so we had no friends. <laughs> we, oh my God, we were holy. I mean, we were holy. And that's why no one liked us. Not because we were obnoxious or awkward. <laughs> no, because we were just so, so faithful. <laughs> or so we said as we cried ourselves to sleep. <laughs> So we, we would simply not address questions like politics. Politics just never came up, except afterward over coffee. Some of the men might go up in the corner and talk about the latest election. But there was no, there's no theological engagement, and there was no engagement as the church or as individuals. Right? Nothing about art. We never talked about art, good, bad, or indifferent. We never talked about sports. And we were sports crazy in Northern Ontario, but we never talked about it in a Christian way. That is to say, most of what most people did most of the time, we never even discussed. So that's this attitude at its worst. I'm not saying everybody's like that. It certainly wasn't true of John Yoder or Stanley Harrowlands, but it is true of many of perhaps your churches, certainly in my experience, where these things just don't come up. You hear sermon after sermon, Sunday school lesson after Sunday school lesson, book after book, seminar after seminar, and it's never talked about. All that's talked about is personal pride. Me and Jesus, maybe us together, being good, being warm, grooving on the spirit, and staying holy, and maybe evangelizing, and that's it. Does that sound familiar to some of you? That's all there is. And even at its best, <coughs> even at its most sophisticated, in the writings of people like John Yoder and Stanley Hawass, even at its best, there is a deliberate <coughs> withdrawal of Christians from very important areas of public life because of the implication of Christians in violence. And because most people of this sort, when they think about violence, would say that Christians should never be engaged in violence, would mean, therefore, that Christians should never be police officers, should never be involved in the judiciary where they have to give people sentences that will involve them in incarceration. They should never be in the, in the military. And that's a lot of society that is being deliberately evacuated of Christian presence. And they'll say, that's up to God, and it's up to God supervising the world to have non-Christians wield the sword on God's behalf. But Christians shouldn't be there. And I respectfully disagree with them on that. But then, they're not crazy people. These are faithful, smart Christians saying these things. So I better have a good reason to disagree with them rather than just having an instinct that they might be wrong. The other way in which cultural engagement 
is commended to us, other Christians would say, look, if you're going to be a serious Christian in the world, you need to be this kind of Christian. You need to be engaged in this way. The first is, is one very popular view. It happens to be especially popular among theological students currently, as well as others, is that first you have talked about. But the other has a more of a grassroots appeal, and it's, it's take it over for Jesus. <clears throat> that to be properly engaged in the world is to take it over for Jesus. There is not one square inch of the world over which Jesus Christ does not say, Mine, is a famous phrase from a sermon preached by the great Dutch Calvinist Abraham Kuyper. Uh, as it turned out, he was preaching it in America, and the word certainly took root. Because the religious right in America is very much of this sort, right? We're going to take over America and make it Christian again. And the much, much tinier Christian right in Canada says the same thing. And perhaps there are voices like this down under. Christian political parties sometimes sound like that. I understand that every few years New Zealand tries to generate a Christian political party and, and they blow themselves up. <laughs> yeah, I currently understand they're blowing themselves up now. <laughs> We, we don't have uh, uh, Christian parties as exciting as, as yours. Being, <laughs> being Canadian, we're, we're even duller than New Zealand. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I've taught a lot of Canadians, I understand. <laughs> but there is this sense that if we could just marshal the votes, if we can just marshal public opinion, what Jesus wants is for us to make... Canada Christian again, make America Christian again, maybe they call, call New Zealand back to Jesus and, and, and make it Christian. And, and that certainly has a lot of appeal. In fact, it appeals to a wide range of Christians. This is the typical cultural attitude of the religious right, but also the religious left. Because the, the liberal Christian movements in our countries also want to make our countries Christian, just according to their understanding of politics and ethics. And it's also true, historically, of, of huge batches of Latin American theology, liberation theology, to reframe the structures of life so that they are in accord with biblical principles. <coughs> and I don't mean the, 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 the lunatic fringe of liberation theology. I mean even people as sensible and sober as Gustavo Gutierrez in, in the sort of the ur text of the theology of liberation. I mean that the, the structures of society should reflect Biblical gospel principles and the Christian mandate is to try to work toward that kind of thing. Roman Catholicism typically through the centuries has seen its stance toward the world as embracing the world and making it function properly according to Christian principles. And so it's been in the Calvinist movement or the Reformed movement more broadly since the 16th century is to penetrate society with Christian principles and reform institution by institution, sector by sector, politics, education, arts, health care, the, the leisure type, bring it all under Christian principles, slowly by slowly, realistically to be sure, but ultimately that's the goal. Now, that kind of world transformative Christianity I encountered as a graduate student, and it was tremendously exciting to me come from a very narrow sectarian background, and to have the whole world opened up as an appropriate field for Christian endeavor, in fact, as an imperative field for Christian endeavor. We, we needed to be there in the arts. We needed to be there in politics. We needed to be there in every sphere of life. The whole world is God's, and God wants it all back, and we need to be out there drawing everyone and every institution into gospel Christian principles. Now that's an extremely exciting uh, point of view. Now, so what, what could possibly be, be wrong with that? Why wouldn't I simply teach that approach? Well, the historian in me has noticed what's happened in history when Christians have been able to take over societies and run them the way they wanted to. And the, um, the record is checkered at best. If we think of Puritan England under Oliver Cromwell, not a place you necessarily want to live. Go forward a century to Puritan New England 
Lots to commend it, lots to be impressed by. Also, probably not a place you want to spend Saturday night, let alone <laughs> Sunday morning. You, you move forward in history, we think of Tsarist Russia. That was a thoroughly Christian regime. And when I lectured in St. Petersburg a couple of years ago and boned up on my Russian history, I got horrified the more I studied about what it was really like to live under these faithful Orthodox Tsarist rulers. Or well, we come back across the ocean to, to North America and you live in 19th century American South. Very Christian. A whole society built on slavery and chattel slavery. I mean, the worst, worst kind. It, and, and, and you go to South Africa. There's a country shaped powerfully by reform principles, including a principle derived from Christian theory known as apartheid. So when Christians have had the opportunity, and we have, uh, and you notice I've picked on different sorts, right? Catholic, Protestant, Orthodox. When we've had the opportunity to run the show, it's never been an entirely happy situation. <coughs> And you could say, well, that's just because we're sinners and we, we keep screwing up. And that is true. We are sinners and we do keep screwing up. But if we keep manifesting significant failure, then maybe we need to revisit whether it's God's will for us to keep trying to do that. Like, maybe it's not that we need to try to do it and get it right this time. Maybe we shouldn't even be trying. Maybe it's not the will of God for us to try to take over a culture and maybe that can't work until Jesus returns. Maybe a theocracy only works when the theos is actually present. So I've begun to wonder about this. This is a very exciting and liberating kind of way to think. But it tends toward, and historically it has, it tends towards chauvinism. We are right, and the rest of you are wrong, in as much as you disagree with us. It tends toward imperialism. Not only are we going to take over this, but we're going to just keep taking over stuff. Because when do you stop taking over things in the name of Jesus? Only till the whole world is yours. It tends toward imperialism. It tends toward coercion. It tends toward violence. And it finally tends toward totalitarianism. Which is what you have under Oliver Cromwell as Lord Protector. Which is what you have under the New England Patriarchs in Salem and Boston. It's what you have in Tsarist Russia. It's what you have in other regimes as well. Because if we're right, and God is on our side, and we know what we're doing, why would you do anything other than insist that everybody do what you say? You see, the, 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 the whole thrust leans toward a totalitarian direction. Which, as I say, I think is perfectly fine if Jesus is running the show. But if it's just us, running the show in the name of Jesus, not so sure about that, particularly when I look at the historical record. This attitude also tends to keep Christians from recognizing their own faults and from respecting others and learning from others. That's a more gentle way of saying they tend to be know-it-alls. And you, you, when you bump up against certain kinds of Calvinists, certain kinds of Catholics, certain kinds of folks in these traditions historically and contemporarily, one of the ways you know you're running up against this is when they know and they tell you, and to the extent that you disagree, you are simply talked down to or dismissed. In other words, it's not, not just a personality type, it's not just that these people happen to be you know, obnoxious. It's that the very thrust of this mentality tends that way. See what I'm saying? Even sort of nice people will tend that way because of the way this form of Christianity views the world, this, this form of mission. So what I want to suggest to you over the time we have is a, a third one. Now, the first one is be holy and stay holy. The second one is, is take it over for Jesus. This third one has a much, well, frankly, less exciting, in fact, in some ways, truly Canadian um, <laughs> slogan. Let's, let's just make, let's make the best of it. <laughs> <coughs> we're, we're, we're coming up to, uh, to, to Canada Day pretty soon, on the 1st of July, and uh, Canadians uh, will, will probably remember it that day. And um, we'll have a brief 
uh, but, but modest flash of patriotism, and <laughs> then we'll carry on. Um, we, we, don't, we don't really know what to do. Uh, but the Americans know what to do on the 4th of July, and uh, you know, they get excited uh, about you know, red, white, and blue, and, and, and founding fathers, and all sorts of other things. And, and, and the Brits are excited on the Queen's birthday, and Aussies are excited whenever anybody opens a fridge. And <laughs> trade in ruthless uh, stereotypes. <laughs> but the Canadians, eh, not, not so much, this is a very Canadian kind of, so we'll make the best of it. And I think there might be some resonance in, in New Zealand as well, uh, perhaps, uh, to this way of uh, dealing with things. And, and among Christian groups, uh, this tends to be among what we might call activistic Lutherans and chastened Calvinists. They tend to meet in the middle. Like the Lutherans who, who have decided that they, they need to be more proactive, they, sh they shouldn't yield too much to the powers that be, because there's a, there's a kind of fatal, um, fatalism, so to speak, in Lutheranism that says, well, you know, this is of God, God's running the show, so we have to respect the powers that be, and you know, what can you do? It's, it's, it's um, I guess, what God's ordained. It's the kind of thing that drove Dietrich Bonhoeffer crazy, his fellow Lutherans. So there didn't seem to be internal resources to fight back against uh, clearly ungodly regimes. So the activistic Lutherans tend to be this way, and Calvinists who have recognized some of the dangers I pointed out in the previous slide, what I call chastened Calvinists, those who don't want to be imperialistic, those who don't want to be chauvinistic, <coughs> uh, they tend to migrate to this, uh, to this outlook as well. And in fact, it seems to me most of the rest of us as Christians who haven't joined up with one or the other of the previous models probably are kind of getting along in this zone, we just don't have a way of thematizing it theologically. We don't have a way of articulating it. It's, it's our intuitive way of being in the world. But we can actually feel kind of guilty when we run into model number one or number two. If they seem so devoted and they seem so clear and we seem to be kind of bumping along, you know, fixing this and sorting out that, and as I understand, you say down here, using a great wire to sort of fix things as we can. And um, it doesn't sound very theologically grand, does it? It doesn't sound very inspiring. And so, so what I want to do over these next a couple of mornings is to uh, inspire you, but in, in an appropriately Canadian and Kiwi way. So, <laughs> two, a little, little, little bit excited. <laughs> Well, well, why not? And let's just be fair. I, I've been critical of the other two. What's, what's the danger here? Well, the danger here is that you're going to be presented with some kind of clever, but really pretty sad, compromise. You're going you're gonna to be you're going to be settling for a less exciting form of Christianity than the first two. The danger here is that this is exactly what a kind of disillusioned middle-aged guy would say to a bunch of keen, younger people. And you've got to be on your guard about that, because you know, when, when sad, disillusioned, middle-aged people talk to you, they sort of want to project on you their own sad disillusionment, and then you have to be careful. To. Well, maybe you've had a, a, a dissatisfying life, but not me. I, I'm going to be faithful for Jesus. And when I was in, in, in your shoes, that's how I would feel sometimes about 50-something-year-old guys. So, so be on your guard, right? Be on your guard. Make sure I, I'm not watering down your fervor. Uh, what I'm hoping to do is actually stir it up and direct it in, I think, helpful and effective ways. But let's see whether I'm doing that or whether I'm just dragging you down to my own gray world of mediocrity. Okay? So, 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 so. Let me stop and see if there are any questions or comments on what you've heard uh, so far. I, I don't know what there are, but if there are, I'm happy to entertain for a minute. Not yeah, you, you just can stay rest of the <laughs> Good. Well, I thought it was perfectly clear, too. Let's go on. Okay. <laughs> uh, James, remind me when we're supposed to be done. 10.30? Yeah. I'll see you in a minute. Yep. So this is actually just one long lecture, and I'm just going to break it up conveniently at the end of each day. So we can, I, I, I don't, because these schedules in the slide if the opening speakers don't behave themselves. So I want to be a good guest to keep you on. So 10 minutes from the time, we're going to be done. Actually, yeah, I have a question. Oh, good. Um, why, why do you limit it to only three models? Yes, good question. So you hear the question? Why did I limit it to only three models? Um, 
because um, I, I fear complexity, but also <laughs> felt like you keep in my heart. But, but, but also because in, in my assessment of the landscape, only the first two, one or the other, tend to be the ones that show up whenever anybody talks about this subject and are keen to commend this model to stir up a crowd. Uh, it tends to be one of those first two. There are, in fact, other models, and I've left them out. In, in Richard Deaver's classic study of Christ and culture, he gives us five models, in fact. And in <coughs> my book, which is over here yonder, which is the long version of these lectures, I discuss those five models. Uh, and actually, Christians at different times and places uh, do use those five models, and they're all commendable in certain ways. Um, but so, what I'm focusing on for the sake of a, a short lecture rather than a book is the three that I think tend to be the ones that are do that dominate the landscape right now, the ones you're most likely to encounter. Okay. Thanks. All right, let's carry on. <coughs> I need to need to take you back to the uh, the misty era of the 1960s and 70s. Mm -hmm. uh, so the land uh, before time. <laughs> <laughs> And, and back, back in the shopping malls uh, of those days, um, before there were these lovely glass and plastic things that we have now to guide us around shopping malls and help us to efficiently spend our money, <laughs> there, there, were, there were boards at the entrances of shopping malls, like they're wooden boards. I mean, how medieval, right? But there were wooden painted <laughs> boards with, with sort of charts of the stores. Uh, and and like, much like you have today, but just older technology. And wherever you were, in the, in the mall, there would be a kind of an orange day glow sticker, and it would be, you are here. And there would always be some little mall rat that would, would come along and sort of chisel that off. <laughs> <laughs> the security guards weren't looking, so you would come in, you'd be bewildered, and there were people who wandered for days in the mall. <laughs> Shopping, but not but never really uh, knowing what they were doing, so they couldn't find the orange sticker. You know, so, so you were here. If, if we're looking at a, a large map, if we're looking at a complex landscape, uh, we might understand the landscape pretty well, but we still need to orient ourselves. Right? We need to know where we are in relation to that landscape. I can look at maps, and I've been looking at maps of New Zealand over the last uh, several days, and I've gotten to know the outline of the country very well, but I also want to know where am I, because I've got to conduct today's business, and I, I can't just know New Zealand. I've got to know where am I on that geographical chart. The same thing's true chronologically. Not just geographically, not just in terms of space, but also in time. And it's crucial when it comes to Christian ethics that we understand the outline of the Christian story and we understand where we are in it. Because a lot of mistakes are being made today and have been made by Christian ethicists who, one could say, are mislocating us. Are <coughs> we are on a different point of the Christian timeline than we are. Let me show you what that means and how important it is to remember where we are in the Christian story. I'll pause for a minute and ask my friend James, if you could give me a glass of water, that would help me get through this. I'm standing in front of the fire, so it's looking dry. And if it seems dry to you, it's not me, it's just the fire. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> It seemed boring, but it was just the fire, he said, so. <laughs> so, we often find it helpful to have a kind of a fourfold understanding of, of, the, uh, of the, the Christian story. And, and as you all know, um, the Bible begins with the beginning. Thank you, my friend. Um, you would have made a great teaching assistant. <laughs> <laughs> and so on, and so on. Okay. So in the beginning, uh, God created the heavens and the earth. So from the Christian point of view, or from our uh, Jewish uh, ancestors, um, the God, God creates things. God makes the world, and the world, uh, God looks at it, and behold, it was good, good right? So, so God makes a good world. Now that's really important, because God didn't make us as little sparks of the divine that are good, who somehow got entrapped in an evil world of matter from which we must then find a way of <coughs> escape, which tends to be the ancient Greek and Indian understandings of the human situation. 
right? The world is not a good place. The world, at best, is a more or less pleasant place that needs to nonetheless be escaped through meditation, philosophy, or something else. That's an Aryan chain from ancient Greece to Indian philosophy. Or the world is a combination of things that we like and things that we don't, but it's neither good nor bad. It just is what it is. And the sensible tribes person listens to her elders and does what they tell her in order to negotiate life as safely and as happily as possible. But that's all you can expect from life, whether you are a Maori or an Aboriginal Australian or a Native Canadian and so on. This would be the way Native traditions tend to look at our way in the world. You know, it's got goods and bads, and you just got to make, uh, make the best of what you can uh, as you move toward whatever we think is beyond the grave. And of course, they disagree about that depending on the tradition. The Jewish and Christian tradition said, no, the world's good. And so far, so good. But there are ethical arguments being made today that sound like, from this point of view, the speaker seems to think that he's still in Eden, as if the world's just good. No. Who thinks that? Who could be so naive? as to think that we're still in Eden and everything's good. Have you encountered ethical arguments today that go like this? Well, if it's natural, it's good. God made me this way, so that must be good. This is the way I am biologically, and therefore that must be good. This is a natural product, so it must be good. <laughs> That argument only works if you're in Eden. It does work if you're in Eden. <coughs> if, in fact, you know that the world is good, then anything that's in the world, ipso facto, is good. But if you're not in Eden anymore, then that argument doesn't hold. But people are arguing that way. And it's, they're, they're in the wrong spot on the timeline. The next spot in the timeline is, well, comes pretty fast in the Bible, like you get to enjoy Eden for like two chapters. <laughs> Thanks, you know? Very good, and then it's not, right? <laughs> and, and the world endures this bad fall in, in Genesis chapter 3, where our ancestors screw things up, just like, like I do, <laughs> pretty regularly. But they, they screw it up first. <laughs> they have to read the Bible, you know, they screw it up first. And the world endures, well, all sorts of implications. And in some ways, quite mysterious, but they, it sounds like the whole thing, the world endures a kind of bad fall. Now, some Christians and others seem to act as if this fall was utter, was cataclysmic. Now, it was very serious, don't get me wrong. It's a terrible, terrible problem, the, re the reverberations of which go across the whole globe and the implications of which really are quite serious. They're mortally serious, in fact. But there are Christians who tend to think, and they act as if, we are now in a horrible world. And so the best thing you can do is simply stay away from the world and try to stay safe from it and hang on till Jesus comes back. In fact, there are whole traditions of Christianity that navigate the world by figuring out what the world does and then not doing it. In fact, we've even borrowed some language in the New Testament, misappropriated in some ways, and, and we say, well, that, A, B, or C, that's worldly, so we won't do it. It's a marker of worldliness. It's a marker of this world. And since this world is not my home, I'm just a passing through. My treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the blue. The angels beckon me from heaven's golden shore. <laughs> and I can't be at home in this world anymore. That's that side, by the way, the accent of Zion. <laughs> Why would that song sound like that? And so, so the, the attitude here is that the world's actually a, a bad, dangerous place. And so I grew up in a tradition like this. And so what did the world do? The world played cards, so we didn't. And, and the world went to dances, and so we didn't. <coughs> we drank alcohol, so we didn't. Now, we weren't brainless. It wasn't as if there's no danger to alcohol. There's lots of danger to alcohol. It wasn't as if there's no, there's no danger in cards. I mean, gambling is a serious problem, and it's an addiction that afflicts a lot of people. It's not as if, as if dancing is completely innocuous. 
we all know now when we watch movies and TVs that as soon as the, the, the protagonist and the love interest start dancing, well, we pretty much know what's going to happen next, right? <laughs> it happens pretty fast nowadays. <laughs> so it's not as if our ancestors were crazy people who were fearing the wrong things, but they tended to think simplistically. So they just said, well, because there's danger there, we just won't do it. I would say you can't live in the world like that, because electricity is dangerous too. You know, fire is dangerous, too much water is dangerous, but you, know, you don't stop using electricity, fire, and water, just because it's dangerous. But, but my ancestors tended to, maybe some of yours did too. As if the whole thing's just fallen, and then the world's just a dangerous, terrible, crappy, horrible place. Let's just huddle together until we finally go on to glory. Now the Bible gives us two chapters in Genesis, one chapter uh, on the fall, and then most of the rest of the Bible is about redemption. But the story of redemption is at least in three major chunks, Old Testament Israel, Jesus, and the church. Let's skip ahead to consummation, which is where we're going, the, the, the world to come. We'll talk more about that tomorrow. But the Bible gives us this narrative. Once there was a lovely planet. Then it got badly hurt, and the maker came to rescue the planet, and over a long, long time, is rescuing the planet, and one day, everybody will live happily ever after. Now, that's the Christian narrative. Not told quite that way, but, but that's the way it goes. But if we go back to the, to the third category, redemption, it's really important to recognize that there are at least these three important moments in the history of redemption. And it's important to know where you are on that story. Clearly, we're not a consummation. We're not at the end of, of, of the age. Although some Christians seem to act like being in what they call the last days means that we should be acting as if heaven has come to earth and we should all be acting as if it's the consummation of ages now. That would be an important ethical mistake. It's, it's because we're not at the end of days yet. We're still, Jesus hasn't returned. The Holy Spirit hasn't flooded the, the world yet. And so it's very important that you be careful of Christians who say, we should live according to A, B, and C, because A, B, and C is the way we will live in the world to come. Well, it is true. We will live A, B, and C in the world to come. But we're not there yet. Well, but, but the kingdom of God is at hand. The kingdom of God has broken it. Yes, already there is light from the world to come. Already there are values from the world to come. Already there is the Holy Spirit from the world to come infusing the world. But we're not there yet. <coughs> We're not at the ultimate stage of history, we're at the penultimate stage. And so it's important to ethically decide what does it mean to not yet be in Christ's final kingdom. Well, we're not in Old Testament Israel times either, but some Christian ethicists seem to act as if we are, as if, for instance, you could simply read right out of the Old Testament what contemporary New Zealand life should be. And that strikes me as a category mistake, like, like we're not ancient Israel tramping around the Middle East following Moses and the Ark, like, like we're really not. I mean, lots happened since then. <laughs> and in fact, the New Testament has happened since then, and it shows us that the Old Testament continues to be Word of God for us, it continues to be authoritative, it continues to be a rich resource for us, but we don't read it as if it is written directly to us, because we're not ancient Israel, and we're not back then and there. We're here now as Christians. Americans and Canadians tend to grab verses like First Chronicles. Like, if, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray, I will hear them and heal their land. And, and, and this happens a lot in American religious rallies. But you know, that was there and then. That's not here and now. It's not that we ignore the Old Testament. That's a terrible problem. It's that we read it properly and understand what it means for us. A more attractive mistake is the next one, is to act as if we're tramping around with Jesus in Galilee. And so we go to the Gospels to find out how we're supposed to live. Our 16-year-old son, the middle one, came back from summer camp with, with a bracelet, WWJD. 
And you know, his father is a sophisticated theological professor, so I was thinking, well, that's not quite right, you know, because it's not really what would Jesus do, but you know, if a 16-year-old boy is wearing a bracelet, that's the one I want him to wear. Mm -hmm. In fact, I was offering to buy it for him in steel. <laughs> this picture never came off. Did you get it? <laughs> what would Jesus do? That's pretty good. That's good for a 16-year-old, but it's not so good for grown-up adults. Why? Why isn't it enough to, to simply ask, what would Jesus do? Because you're not Jesus. <laughs> not to put too fine a point on it, you're not Jesus. There are ways in which Jesus, as the Son of Man, shows us what it means to be yielded to the Father, to be directed by the Holy Spirit, to be doing God's work in the world. There are lots of important ways in which Jesus is our example. And the historic tradition of Imitatio Christi is valid. We do want to look at Jesus as our model in some ways, but in other ways, really not. Like Jesus was a man. So, so much for you non-men. <laughs> Jesus was single, but most people are called to marriage. Jesus died really young. <laughs> Glad that's not the pattern. <laughs> Jesus was Jewish. Probably almost nobody in this room is. Like, there's lots of ways in this Jesus, and th th by the way, those four little demographics, those aren't and incidental, those are actually key to Jesus' life and work. I just picked funny things like Jesus was so high or he happened to like yogurt or something. I mean, I'm not <laughs> picking kind of key things about him that nonetheless don't immediately <coughs> translate to most Christians. So there's lots of ways in which Jesus, and of course Jesus is like savior of the world, and you're not. <laughs> Jesus is entitled to worship, and you're not. Probably you can't you think you are, but you're really not. <laughs> So it's actually a matter of careful biblical hermeneutics, of interpretation to understand how is Jesus properly an example for us, and how is he not? How is he unique and, and not like us? So to simply say, what would Jesus do, is actually not the right question. It's, what would Jesus want me to do here and now? <laughs> Which is a much bigger bracelet. And I, I give that to you as a fundraising possibility. <laughs> Some more bees that way. What would Jesus want me to do here and now? Because we're not there and then. And in, in, other, in other words, it won't do to simply flip open the Gospels and make an easy connection between what Jesus is doing and saying, because that's upstream of a lot of uh, 2,000 years of Christian history. It's upstream of Pentecost. It's upstream of the Ascension. It's upstream of the Resurrection and Crucifixion, which are kind of important events, right? That change things. <laughs> So that's why you can't just go to the Gospels and read that either. You've got to look at the whole Bible and interpret it properly. We are in the era of the church. And so we need to take the whole Bible seriously and Christian history seriously and that kind of reflection to say, now here we are in New Zealand in 2015. What does that mean? How do we think appropriately about what it means to be a Christian and follow Jesus here and now? And in the next couple of mornings I have with you, I'll try to answer that question as uh, best I can. Let me pause for a couple minutes of questions, and then we'll get you on your way. Anything that you want to break before we part this morning? Um, yes, please. Could you talk more about the era of the church? What does that mean? Yes, thanks. When we think of the era of the church, we mean that in fact we are downstream of what we have received from Jesus and also what we have been able to learn about God through Jesus' crucifixion and resurrection, through his ascension and his commissioning of the church, through the coming of the Holy Spirit in Pentecost, through what we read of the Acts and the Epistles, the book of Revelation, and as I say, 2,000 years where the Holy Spirit has kept teaching the church not in the same mode as the Bible, but in analogous modes of offering additional light and reflection and sophistication and helping us simply adapt biblical teachings to medieval Europe or 16th century China or 21st century New Zealand. And so we have this rich experience to draw on as we try to figure out how we're supposed to live. And I've tried to show you a little bit of that today by saying, well, what happens if we decide that it makes sense for us to take over cultures in the name of Jesus? Doesn't that seem like a good idea? Well, let's see historically what's happened when we try. 
history comes to our aid when we're thinking about theological and ethical questions. And it keeps us from too easily coming to simplistic conclusions that sound really good when you're sitting around in front of a fire talking about principles. Well, let's just see what's happened when we've tried. Ooh, that, that, ooh that's pretty bad. Ooh, that's, that's another bad one. We've got to go back and think about that some more. So now we're in this era in which the Holy Spirit is using the church and other means too to spread the gospel of Jesus around the world and to call the whole world uh, to himself. And things are really different today. I mean, I, I look around the room and see just on your faces a number of distinctly different ethnic groups and mixes represented in your physiognomies. Christianity is now a global religion, but it wasn't quite recently. Really, before really 1900, or at least 1850, it was largely a Caucasian religion. There were ancient churches in other parts of the world, and the church had come and gone in Japan and China and so on. But to be a truly global faith, it took the missionary movement of the 19th and of the 20th century and what's going on now. Um, it's it's a, really a different era. It's a very exciting era, but it's a relatively recent era. Uh, and, and we have new experience to reflect upon. This is where we are now. With lots has happened, and lots remains uh, to have happened. So we're not there yet. And it's important when we think about ethics to realize we're not there yet. And what does it mean to be here now? One more. Um, you mentioned about some people saying, like, thinking that we are at the consummation yeah. period. Could you give some examples of the sort of things that they would say that we should do because we will be doing it then? So, do you hear the question? Um, he's asking me about people who act as if we are at the consummation today. He's asking properly for some examples. Like, like who, who thinks that way? What would be some examples of that? I work a lot in, in gender and um, sort of feminism and uh, sort of equal rights for, for sexes. And, and we've got a, another book coming up this fall on, on the Christian understanding of gender. And uh, I, I'm going to use the F word for myself. I'm a feminist. Uh, and I say that because partly because most people don't think this is what a feminist looks like, right? <laughs> <laughs> a feminist is really a fairly unattractive, bitter, Lesbian who hates men. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm not, you know, a, a bitter lesbian. <laughs> I do like women, but that's the only way. It's <laughs> but I'm a feminist in sort of the, the classic sense. I just don't think women should be discriminated against. I, 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 I'm so, some of my Christian feminist friends, however, are impatient with me because I recognize that even though I think and they think that in the world to come, these gender lines would disappear. And I also suggest that in societies like contemporary New Zealand and Canada, I don't think these gender lines should continue for the reasons I suggest in my book. But I also understand that God pragmatically accommodates himself to some of the weaknesses and difficulties in human society, such as patriarchy, in order that the gospel may succeed. So some of my students are missionaries in Muslim-majority countries in the world. And even though they might be feminists themselves, and they are, when they are living in Pakistan or in Turkey or other places, they wear head coverings, they sit in the back seat of the car, they walk with their men in appropriate ways, even though they don't believe in the patriarchy that it, that it uh, embodies, because it's worth it for the sake of the gospel. It's worth it to not offend your neighbors immediately about gender in order that the more important matter of the gospel happens. Um, because we're not there yet. And some of my feminist friends are quite impatient with that. They said, no, no we, we live in, in, in the, the last days. The Holy Spirit's poured out on women as well as men. We should live in the full freedom of the gospel right now. And I'm saying, well, actually, you can't explain, I think, the New Testament in the last 2,000 years of Christian history uh, that way. Um, I think you have to understand that God calls us, actually, to accommodate ourselves to the realities of being in the penultimate rather than the ultimate. Uh, we can't live as if Jesus has fully come back, because he hasn't. And that would be one of the ways we have to actually compromise. So that's a quick uh, illustration of that. I'm happy to talk to you about that more. Okay, let me uh, hand back to, uh, to our